I covered hundreds, if not thousands, of vehicle crashes. I covered trials of drunk drivers who killed people. I spoke with family members of loved ones of hit and runs who were killed in those crashes. The pain experienced by victims and their family members is unbearable, and we will hear from some of them at this event today. I learned while reporting on crashes that language does matter. We often refer to crashes as accidents in which a car struck a person. We almost never say a driver hit someone. We say, well, it was an accident, as if these crashes are inevitable. It's just too hard sometimes to think about our own massive responsibility when we get behind the wheel. But crashes are not inevitable. There is a lot that we can do to reduce the chances of crashes and lives being lost. The way we design our roads, educate drivers, write our laws, and enforce our laws all play a big role. They all make a difference. And it is very clear that we can and should do so much more. More than 40,000 people, 40,000 people were killed in vehicle crashes last year. That is an 8% increase over 2019. Now is exactly the time to fight for the people who lost their lives and those who walk, bike, and drive every day to get around our communities. These are our fellow citizens who travel our streets and they deserve to make it to their destinations unharmed. Here in Monroe County, I was proud to introduce the Carrie Ray's three-foot passing law to protect bicyclists, which mandates that vehicles pass bicyclists at a three-foot distance. Carrie was a beloved teacher and cyclist who was killed by a passing driver. This is the standard, this three-foot distance. This is the standard in more than 30 other states. The good news is that every single Monroe County legislator signed on to this legislation and it will pass. I don't think this would have been possible if not for the support of Carrie Ray's husband, Michael, who may be here today. There is so much more work to do and we're now going to hear from our speakers about their losses and what they would like to see happen and how we can support this effort. Our first speaker is Bobby Koval, the mother of Jack. Bobby. Thank you, Rachel. So I'm Bobby. I live here in Rochester. And this is my son, Jack. There's Jack's dad, Jack's cousins, Jack's aunts, Jack's grandma, Jack's friends. And we all remember what we've lost. And what we've lost is a tremendous human being who brought more to society than any one of us in this family had done so far. Just real quick, get a little closer to our mics. Yeah, there that, we go. Sorry. There you go. That's all right. That'd be unique. That's fine. That helps. Okay, so in 2016, Joe's my only child, Jack, graduated from college, got his dream job in New York City got that apartment, he could see the Hudson River. Can you imagine this? He's 22. Six weeks later, we get the call, the call that everyone never, ever wants to get. And not only did we get the call, but we got the call 36 hours after Jack's death because the person who killed Jack was veiled by the NYPD. Yep, off-duty officer heading home. We were fortunate to be invited to the DMV hearing, and we were also incredibly fortunate, we're told, that that driver got a 90-day suspension. 90 days, he couldn't drive. 90 days, Jack was still dead. So he made multiple driving errors and was convicted of that by that DMV administrative law judge, but never got a ticket, never got a charge and we're still in court. It'll be five years this year. We don't want this to happen. We need more protection for bicyclists and pedestrians. 
These aren't accidents. These are reckless, endangered drivers. And if we don't get them off the road after their multiple offenses, they'll continue. And we need to start taking care of this business of getting the drivers that are causing the harm off the road. In addition, the victims have no rights. In New York State, there is no pain and suffering for parents of children who are killed by cars. No one really realizes that, right? There is no monetary penny that's come our way during this whole endeavor. So you can imagine, you don't plan funeral expenses for a 22-year-old, but you gotta dig it in and take care of that. And then you gotta tell your mother that your kid's been killed. And you know how your mothers are. You're supposed to take care of your kids. <sighs> what a failure, right? I don't know what else to say other than these bills have got to get passed. Things have to change. We have to police better and we have to do it fairly. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick Lynch. Um, this hat I'm wearing was my son Michael's hat. The angel pins on the side represent my wife Bernadette and my son Michael, who are now in heaven. On March 30th, 2017, our lives were changed forever. At 8 a.m., my wife left the house for what would be her first infusion in her second round of chemotherapy. She had been diagnosed several months earlier with leomyosarcoma. As she left our driveway, she noticed a lot of commotion, lights and sirens at the other end of our block. She asked me to try calling our son Michael, who had left for school a few minutes earlier. I tried calling and it eventually went to voicemail. I decided to go down the block and see what the commotion was all about. In the street, I saw Michael's backpack and a single sneaker lying in the road. I knew this was not gonna be a good day. At that point, I did not realize just how serious things actually were. I yelled to the police officer, what hospital have they taken him to? Strong Memorial, I was advised. I called my wife and asked her to stay where she was. I was on my way to come get her. Yes, the commotion did involve our son. At the hospital, we were given a brief update that Michael was in rough shape. He was still in surgery. At this point, we were introduced to the organ transplant facilitators to discuss timelines and options. I thought this was a formality and not a specific indicator of Michael's prognosis. Our world became a dream sequence at this point. We learned that Michael had been hit with sufficient, cause, sufficient force to cause his heart to stop beating. His brain was deprived of oxygen for an extended period of time. His brain had been knocked off its axis. He was out of surgery and on a ventilator. As the world prepared for Easter vacation, we were coming to grips with having to plan our son's funeral. No parent should ever be faced with the decision of whether or not to turn off their child's ventilator. It is a partic particularly difficult walk through hell. After Michael's burial, I became obsessed with understanding the hows and whys of the events leading to Michael's death. The media narrative at this point was, a Ronda Coitin hit by car, he was not in a crosswalk, driver not charged. The police did what they had to do. Investigations affirmed Michael was not on his cell phone when he was struck. It was actually still in his pants pocket. We were asked if Michael was being bullied, bullied, was he unhappy at home, et cetera, et cetera. The prevailing synopsis was that Michael left our house, ran down the street, and ran right across Cooper Road. That made no sense to me, so I tried to do what dads do, dismantle and analyze the actual chain of events. I FOIL requested witness statements and reached out to the witnesses via social media. I spoke to friends and acquaintances who were at that corner around that time. One friend saw Michael standing at the corner where the crosswalk is, waiting for cars to let him cross in the crosswalk. The cars were stopping in the crosswalk instead of behind it. 
At some point, Michael decided to travel further up Cooper Road and attempt his cross. On that day, the speed limit on Cooper Road was 35 miles per hour. There was no reduced speed limit in place in front of the school. There was only a flashing yellow light. I inquired on the yellow light and was told, it's not a mandate to reduce your speed, only a suggestion. I did research and learned that at 35 miles per hour, only three, in t three out of 10 pedestrians would survive impact by a car. We live in a school district with no busing. Either you walk to school or your parents drive you. There were no crossing guards in place on that day. The media narr narrative remained, not in a crosswalk, driver not charged at this time. Our supervisor was extremely proactive in getting the speed limit reduced and two crossing guards were put on permanent duty. I learned how a county road required the collaboration of town, county, and DOT to implement a speed reduction. I learned that the DOT analyzes how many cars can get through a traffic light during a cycle as a way of assigning speed limits. I learned that the car that hit Michael was riding the bumper of the car in front of it. That is why the driver and my son did not see each other. I learned there would be a customary DMV hearing six months after Michael's death. It would include a judge, the driver, witnesses, and myself if I wished to attend. I was told in advance I could not offer an impact testimony. I would be in listen mode only. If I spoke, I would be removed from the hearing. My son's death was just as life-altering as a murder or a DWI fatality. I am happy that others benefit from the reduced speed limit on Cooper Road and the presence of two crossing guards. The bitter piece of me wishes they were in place on March 30th, 2017. Thank you for letting me fill in the dots between he was not in a crosswalk and driver not charged. I think we can do better than this. Now we're going to hear from Harvey Botsman, the New York Bicycle Coalition board member emeritus. Come on up, Harvey. Here I am. Thank you very much for uh, having this wonderful uh, demonstration, if nothing else to call it, but it's actually to inform people, to educate people. The New York Bicycling Coalition has the only statewide ed uh, bicycling education and uh, advocacy organization. Strongly supports this package of bills that include three-foot passing distance, among others, as well as victims' rights uh, legislation in the state assembly and state senate. Thank you. Mark Robbins from the Rochester Bicycling Club. Hi, I'm Mark Robbins from the, uh, with the Rochester Bicycling Club advocacy coordinator for that organization. It's a 600 plus member club whose primary mission is to provide and organize recreational rides throughout our beautiful region. Um, having said that, the club, as part of its mission, is committed to preserve and proclaim the rights and responsibilities of bicyclists by advocating for the enactment of legislation and in the formulation of policies to promote cycling safety. A week or so ago, one of our members uh, posted on our um, safety advocacy and education Facebook group uh, about an incident that she, she and a group of others had experienced on a quiet rural area road, a road not to dissimilar to the roads on which we lost Carrie Ray, Officer Coletti, and so many others. She reported that she was passed 
within inches. She and, she and the group of riders she was with were, uh, were passed within inches by a pickup truck towing a trailer, within inches. Um, it appears that uh, at least three of the laws covered or included in included in this uh, Victims' Rights Act would have made a difference. The three-foot passing law, the modification of uh, pre-licensing curriculum to include information and uh, discussion about motorists, cyclists' interactions, and the um, Dangerous Driving Act. All of those could have, would have made a difference. I, on behalf of the Rochester Bicycling Club and all cyclists in our area, want to thank the organizations for sponsoring this legislative package and urge all to contact their legislatures and tell them that you want them to support the bills included in the Crash Victims Rights and Safety Act. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Amy Cohen and I'm the co-founder of Families for Safe Streets. And we are a club no one should ever have to join. You heard some of our stories today. For me, it is nearly eight years since I lost my 12-year-old son. He was in eighth grade. He was bright, top of his class, a super athlete, and the light of my life. And all he was trying to do on October 8th, 2013, was walk home from school three blocks, grab a snack, cross the street, and go to soccer practice. And it turned out in New York State that's a deadly act. It's a deadly act for three people every single day. A thousand New Yorkers. We are traveling a thousand miles around New York State with a coffin, a thousand flowers, and our van to make a statement and to rally communities around the state. We are visiting crash sites holding rallies like this one to urge passage of eight bills that when you look at them, they're no-brainer bills. We're not talking about making you know, uh, changes that would be horrifying. We are talking about addressing the speeding that is rampant on our streets because speeding is a deadly behavior. And sadly, I know it all too well. A year after my son was killed by a driver going 35, the speed limit was lowered on that street. And the driver was going 25 when a five-year-old boy was trying to cross. And he was struck and hit. And that boy survived and mine did not. That is the difference of lowering the speed limit a few miles per hour, enforcing it with automated enforcement, holding the most reckless drivers accountable with a, a criminal misdemeanor charge, uh, getting our drunk drivers off the road. One of the bills would lower the drug alcohol content from 0.08 to 0.05. Basically, 0.08 is four grown men, I mean, a grown man having four drinks in an hour. And this would lower it to three. Really, more than that, should you be getting behind a multi-ton vehicle that has the potential to kill people? The Crash Victims' Rights and Safety Act also includes rights and, and a safety net for crash victims because every week our, our organization gets a call, can you help me bury my child or my sibling or my spouse? I don't have the money and they're going to send him or her to Potter's Field. What am I going to do? And you know what I offer? Sorry, our government doesn't do anything. All we have, I can help you set up your GoFundMe page. We can and we must do better. And we've seen that as a, as a cities and states, we can do better. You know, we are, are coming out of a horrific time where people are dying in horrible numbers from COVID-19. And we have recognized as a society that how, how secret life is. But we've also recognized that when you have a crisis, our elected officials can act on a dime and put in place solutions to save lives. And low COVID-19 traffic crashes are a preventable public health crisis. And we can and we must do better. We have a few days left in the legislative session and we need our New York State Senate and Assembly members to act with the urgency that this crisis requires and pass these eight life-saving bills. Thank you very much. 
Does anyone have any questions for any of our speakers? And does do we have any other potential speakers here who would like to say a few words? Yes. Thank you so much to Reconnect Rochester for organizing this and uh, for continuously advocating for traffic safety, pedestrians, bicyclists, and better infrastructure. Um, any questions from the media for any of our speakers? Now, I just want to make sure that, that the people, uh, I think there might be a live stream, that people know where to go to find more information about this movement. Um, Amy, can you... Uh, Sure, right here on our on our sign, it is um, that we have a QR code even if you want to scan it. It is transalt.org backslash CVRSA, Crash Victims Rights and Safety Act. There's a QR code. We have a petition that we are sending out uh, to, uh, to the legislative leaders. So please go online and sign our petition. Please protect your children, siblings, spouse, friend, neighbor. This should not have to happen to anyone you love. Please act before it is too late. Good